Okay, thank you. Welcome, everyone. So the question I'm asking in this talk is, does ethnicity predict culture? And we're going to see why this is important and what this means exactly. So we, the literature pretty much t takes it for granted, as I did, that culture and ethnicity are kind of matching categories, that culture happens within ethnic groups and differs across ethnic groups and ethnic groups transmit culture from one generation to the next. So why does this matter a lot? How, how much does ethnicity actually work well in predicting a cultural outcome? And why would that matter? One way to sort of motivate this question, it's not the only possible reason we might be interested in this question, but certainly this is, would be one reason where we would really care about this, is the migration debate. So the migration debate is concerned about possibly some migrants might bring with them some cultural values that might be adverse for the development or the well-being of the receiving country. And this has been brought up specifically in the work of George Borjas, who said, poor migrants bring the culture and norms that led to poor economic conditions in the sending countries in the first place. And then Borjas quotes Paul Collier that uncomfortable as it may be, migrants may bring their culture with them. Clemens and Pritchett refer to this as the new economic case for migration restrictions. But sort of left unstated in this debate and is sort of which, which migrants exactly bring the adverse culture for the receiving country. How would you actually implement this concern on a practical level? Uh, well, one other, one other analyst who had some ideas about how to implement this on a practical level was uh, this guy, uh, our most famous social scientist who, <laughs> who thought that uh, one ethnicity in particular did predict culture. And his way of uh, implementing this would be to call for a total and complete shutdown of the entry of this one religious group to the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what is going on. Uh, that last phrase I kind of take as a standard like academic invocation, more research is needed. <laughs> so I'm trying to answer his call for more research <laughs> right here. So let me give you another quote. I'm, uh, I apologize for circulating these quotes. Uh, and you're probably like me that I'm obsessively reading the sports pages these days to avoid uh, having to read quotes like this in the newspaper, but uh, our social scientist in chief also thought that uh, race seemed to be, he predicted that not only religion but race would be highly predictive of culture. So he singled out some uh, countries of a particular race compared to other countries of another race and used a colorful term to uh, express his idea that they would bring adverse cultural effects with them to the US. So the way this policy is, is actually being uh, debated in some sense is like, would ethnic profiling of migrants sort of help to target the adverse culture and try to exclude the adverse culture from coming to the receiving country? So it's really sort of a debate about ethnic profiling. Of course, that's a big debate, which is mainly going to be decided on moral and empirical, moral and political grounds, not on, not on empirical grounds, of course. But it does seem to reflect a belief that ethnic profiling would be empirically effective, that targeting a particular ethnic group for exclusion would be empirically effective in succeeding at excluding the adverse cultural values that you don't want the migrants to bring. So that empirical belief is just an empirical question. It's not in itself a moral question. Is it empirically true that ethnic profiling a particular group for exclusion would be effective in excluding the adverse cultural values that you don't want? And so empirically that's saying, does, does ethnicity indeed highly, is ethnicity indeed highly predictive of culture? If it is highly predictive of culture, then ethnic profiling would work, and then maybe you decide later it's morally objectionable, but that's, but first of all, this debate is se seemingly influenced by this empirical belief that it could be, could be effective. 
both in Europe and the US, that targeting particular ethnicities could be effective in predicting which, ethnic, with, which ethnic groups bring with them the adverse culture. So this is very different from most of what, most of what the cultural literature is asking. To kind of characterize the culture of a particular ethnic group, we ask, have to ask kind of four big questions. First of all, is there an ethnic effect of this group on culture? So that's the most obvious question. Uh, second, is this ethnic effect of, of this particular group on culture, is it robust across different measures of culture? Because culture is not one dimensional, it has many different dimensions. Third, is an ethnic effect real or is it possibly spurious because what looks like the ethnic effect might be standing in for something else like income differences, education differences, or country effects, where country effects might reflect other things. And lastly, and possibly most importantly, does the individual variance within the ethnic group swamp any ethnic effect on average? So these are very different questions from what the culture, most of the cultural literature is asking. And I'm not actually disagreeing or challenging any of the rest of the cultural literature. I'm asking a very different question that's relevant to this question of like ethnic profiling. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the data I'm going to be using. It's a very standard source in the cultural literature. It's the World Values Survey. Over 80,000 individuals were surveyed in 59 countries. Ethnic groups are coded by religion and race. And I'm gonna use here 13 questions from the World Values Survey that are cultural dimensions that are very much emphasized in the literature on sort of what is good culture for development. And they are five questions on trust, five, four questions on women's rights, and four questions on violence. And what's important here is that the, the literature seems to largely agree on what are the sort of quote, in air quotes, good cultural values. And whenever, in the rest of the talk, whenever I say good or bad cultural values, this, this is a sense in which I mean that cultural values, so for example, high levels of trust, high levels of women's equalities, low tolerance for violence, are all seen as sort of good for development instrumentally and usually often seen as kind of good in and of themselves in the, in the development policy discussion. So I'm, in the empirical measures I'm gonna use, I'm gonna uh, scale all the questions from zero to one. So zero is like the, the, the worst culture, again, worst in air quotes, and one is the best culture on each dimension. And the, the, these values just reflect agreement or disagreement with cultural values expressed in the questions. Often there's intermediate levels of agreement, so some, most of the time they're not dichotomous variables, but are continuous variables from zero to one on each question. Uh, this measure of good culture that I'm using is actually correlated with, with poverty across countries, so it's confirming that yes, culture does matter for, for outcomes like poverty, at least the stylized fact that it's highly correlated. So here's where, let's start now with the juicy stuff. All right, so here's uh, a bunch of coefficients on uh, the result of a regression of the answer to each of these questions on a dummy variable for whether rep respondents in the survey said they were Muslim. So in this first set of regressions, each coefficient here represents a separate regression of this question on a dummy variable for being Muslim. And so again, remember the scale is from zero to one on each question, so that's how you interpret the size of the coefficient relative to that scale of zero to one. And so a negative value here means a movement in the direction of the so-called bad culture, and a positive value would be a, a direct movement in the direction of the good culture. And so let's start asking some questions about this. The, the yellow highlighted coefficients were significant and negative. Uh, later I'm gonna show, any, if any coefficient turns out positive, I'm gonna highlight it in blue. So on the trust, uh, the question is, can most people be trusted? Do you agree? Second, do, do you agree people don't take advantage of you? Do you trust strangers? Do you trust a different religion? Do you trust a different nationality? On women, it asks, do you agree that be a man beating his wife is not, never justifiable? Do you agree women's rights are essential? Do you agree women's discrimination against women is a problem? Uh, do you agree men don't have uh, any intrinsic right to jobs over women? On violence, you're asked whether you carry a weapon, whether you think war, whether you agree that war is never necessary for justice, 
whether you agree that stealing is never justifiable, whether you agree that violence against other people is never justifiable. So in this, these regressions, each, each coefficient is just the coefficient on a Muslim dummy from regressing the answer to this question. So some of these answers are indeed negative. There is a negative and significant effect of, of the Muslim dummy on, on culture in the negative direction. But you see right away that uh, the magnitudes are not very large. Relative to the 0, 1 scale, you get, you're getting coefficients that are usually less than minus 0 0.1 in absolute magnitude. Uh, you also see that the uh, answers are not very robust across cultural dimensions. So the violence thing did not turn out at all. The Muslim dummy was not significant at all on violence. Uh, on women, only two of the four questions were significant. And uh, on trust, there is more, more evidence of a significant effect. But then you act, now, now we go to the next question. Is the ethnic effect spurious? Is it, could it be standing in for something else like income and education? Or could it be standing in for country effects, which are themselves not necessarily ethnic, but could be affected? Country effects may reflect other things like a country's history of autocracy, authoritarian rule, conquest by others. Uh, civil wars, all these things show up in the cultural literature as, as country effects that are not necessarily related to ethnicity. So now in column two, we now control, in column two we're going to control for the individual characteristics like income and education, and in column three we're going to control for the country effects and the individual characteristics. So now you find in, the, in column two, one of the significant effects now loses some of a lot of its significance in the first line whether most people can be trusted the trust effect uh, the trust effect goes down in significance and then when you control for country effects a lot of the significance vanishes altogether in the third column when you control for both individual characteristics and for country effects in the third column now none of the questions on trust uh, is there a significant effect of being Muslim on trust and none of, as before, none of the questions on violence matter. Uh, there's still some effects of, of, uh, of being Muslim on, on attitudes towards women, but you can see now the coefficients are really extremely small. They're you know, barely more than minus 0.01 on the zero to one scale. So in, in terms, if you thought of it in terms of linear probability, being Muslim is resulting in a 1% uh, decrease in the likelihood of agreeing on something like women's rights are essential. And you can see even here, one of these questions goes in the opposite direction. It's significant and positive that, that Muslims are more likely to say that discrimination against women is a problem. So uh, I'm going to skip over this one. I'll come back to it if I have time. Uh, well, let me, let me, this is, I, li I like this table, so let me, let me describe it briefly and then give me a little extra time if necessary <laughs> from Q&A. So, you know, what's also interesting is significance is not everything. There are many possible ethnic groups that you could test. And, you know, some of the significance could be spurious because also you're just running lots and lots of regressions on many possible ethnic groups on many possible questions. And to illustrate that, I tried running these same kind of regressions on a placebo ethnic group uh, that was defined. That I, I, I admit that I did a little data mining to find one placebo group that would be have uh, signif some significant effects. But of course, that data mining is not that different from what we actually do when we're trying many regressions on ethnic groups and and you know on cultural values and many different cultural values on many different ethnic groups, and then kind of like putting a lot of importance on those that are significant. So this placebo group is defined as, uh, this ethnic group is defined as, if your birth year ended in a zero, you're a different ethnic group. So we'll call you the zero birthers. The zero birthers, they also, they show an alarming propensity to justify a man beating his wife, the zero birthers. Uh, they also have a robust effect, believing that stealing can be justifiable. These zero birthers really seem like maybe that also should be a group that, uh, uh, the Mr. President should consider targeting as those whose birth year ends in zero maybe should be selected for ethnic profiling and excluded from U.S. shores and a travel ban on those horrible zero birthers. Uh, so you see that the pattern of significance is not all that different from what, uh, what we're seeing in the, in the Muslim column. Of course, these coefficients are, again, very small. So again, 
uh, significance is not everything. So, you know, the big, the big question is how much explanatory predictive power do the ethnic dummies really, really have? How does it really predict cultural values to say that, you know, this respondent is Muslim and we predict that they will have very different cultural values from a respondent who is not Muslim? So let's look at the data. So here's uh, two histograms of, so now I've taken the next step of constructing an overall cultural index which just averaged the, the answers on all 13 questions. So this is just an unweighted average that will also be between zero and one of the average answer on all 13 questions. Remember, a positive, being closer to one means the good answers that that are seen to be the good cultural values and being closer to zero are the bad cultural values. So of course you can see there's a, a lot of heterogeneity in this histogram of both Muslims and non-Muslims. So you can, you can find a significant difference between these two groups. It's a, the, the difference in the unconditional difference is 0.06 in the bad direction for Muslims compared to non-Muslims. But of course, you can see in the graph that is swamped by individual heterogeneity. There's enormous individual heterogeneity. So the big picture is that ethnic profiling in the, is, is not likely to be effective in this picture because you'd be, by ethnic profiling, a, a group that only slightly differs. And by the way, if you control, as we saw before, if you control for country, country dummies and individual characteristics, the difference falls to 0 0.006 between the Muslim and the non-Muslim respondents in the survey. So, you know, ethnic profiling is, is not effective because you're, you're still excluding a lot of people with good cultural values when you're excluding Muslims, and you're still admitting a lot of non-Muslims with bad cultural values, so it's highly inefficient and ineffective to do ethnic profiling in this, in this context. So here's probably the most important graph. And I've been agonizing a lot uh, over how exactly I'm going to explain this to the president. This, uh, this graph is what is known as a partial scatter. So on the horizontal axis is the, the Muslim dummy. And on the vertical axis are the parts of cultural, this is again the cultural index predicted by being Muslim or, not, or, or being not Muslim. So the not Muslims are on the left, the Muslims are on the right. And the, re, the partial scatter means that you remove the effect of the individual characteristics like income and education and the country dummies. So the residuals on the vertical axis, they mean what is the residual uh, from a, if you predict culture based using the country dummies and the, and the income and education, what is the part of culture left unexplained by, by income, education, and country dummies? And those are the residuals. If there's a positive cultural value that is left unexplained by those dummies, it shows there's a positive on this graph. If there's a negative cultural value that's left unexplained by these dummies, it shows it a negative on the graph. And you can see a horizontal line going across here, which is the regression slope uh, of the regression of these cultural values on the Muslim dummy, on the dummy variable for being Muslim. So, you know, remarkably, the slope of this line is actually statistically significant. It, again, the slope is uh, 0 .0, minus 0 0.006. So it really, it really is statistically significant uh, with a very small magnitude of 0.006 on a zero to one scale of likelihood of having good culture or bad culture. Uh, you can just see looking at the graph, the, the explanatory power of like singling out the Muslims to try to target the bad cultural values, it's pretty much completely useless. Even though it was statistically significant, it's completely useless to try to target the Muslims for exclusion on the hope of sort of excluding the negative cultural values that would be on the, the bottom half of this chart. You just wind up excluding a lot, you would wind up excluding a lot of Muslims who had very good cultural values. And conversely, if you admitted all the people on the left side of the chart, the non-Muslims, you'd wind up admitting a lot of, an equally large amount of people with bad cultural values uh, as, as you would have if you had had no restrictions by ethnic group whatsoever. So the effectiveness, the explanatory power, the empirical effectiveness of ethnic profiling is, it, despite the statistical significance, is basically close to very, very, very close to zero.
So let's summarize the, uh, the results here. Uh, how well does ethnicity predict culture? Is it statistically significant? Are ethnic effects statistically significant? Sometimes yes. Are they quantitatively meaningful? Almost all the time in, in these tables I've shown you, no. No, the, the, the results on the Muslim dummy. In this, in this exercise, I've also done other exercises by race and other religious groups that uh, have pretty similar findings. Uh, so are, the, uh, are the ethnic effects consistent across alternative measures of cultural dimensions? Uh, usually no. Are they robust to controls for individual characteristics or other ethnic group memberships? Usually no. Does the ethnic effect dominate heterogeneity within each group? Uh, no, that, that one really fails badly, and that's really the main reason why ethnic profiling would really fail as far as being effective. So the conclusion here, first of all, nothing here disputes the whole culture matters literature. For culture, for culture to matter in the literature, it, it would be enough just to have small differences in means between groups and small differences in outcomes that you're explaining between groups. So that's, this is really a different it's a different literature that asks whether culture matters or whether culture persists across, uh, across time. Those are all questions that I, I, I find the papers in this literature to be very convincing that there are culture effects and that culture does persist. But for that, you would only need small differences between groups to get those results. Uh, and it's still true that the second point, that descriptive cultural statements about particular ethnicities are simply usually not, not very robust. We're not even sure uh, if an individual belongs to multiple ethnicities, which ethnic dimension matters. We're not sure if it's the characteristics of the individual, like uh, the country of origin or the uh, income and education levels of the individual that matter. Uh, there's really poor explanatory power of ethnic membership for culture as shown in the, the last set of graphs that I showed you, there's enormous heterogeneity within each group. Now this is of a point that's it's very obvious to academic economists who have worked at all with uh, almost any other, any data set in general, not, not just cultural data sets, that there's enormous amounts of individual heterogeneity within groups. Uh, that's fine that everybody knows that in academia. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of the severe reactions against uh, particular groups of migrants like African migrants to Europe or Muslim migrants to Europe and the, and the same set of migrants to, to the US. I don't think the, the popular discussion that expresses a lot of support for ethnic profiling of, of migrants really understands just how vast is the individual heterogeneity within groups relative to what are really very small differences even when you do find them to be statistically significant. And so the bottom line is simply ethnic profiling of migrants would not work to screen out bad culture. Now, I know that's not going to resolve the debate, uh, but if that debate has been at, at all influenced by these sort of mistaken empirical beliefs, then I think it's uh, obligatory on academics to correct those beliefs and come out with accurate information on that whole debate. Thank you very much. Um, well, it, it, surrounded as I am with uh, you know, presumably enlightened people who do want to keep out the Muslims, I think this is important research. Uh, but my two questions are, first, in terms of your research, would this then mean that since you controlled for uh, national origin and then income, does that mean, my first question would, would be that, does that mean that, that all you need to do is keep out the Muslims who come from particular countries and who don't have the right income. So you just have to add those two things. And does that help? Um, just, and then my second question is this. Um, your research, your database is based upon expressed values. But then might a Muslim hater say, well, what people say are their values are one thing. But then don't you want to supplement that research with actual behavior of Muslims? Um, I suspect that Muslims in this country behave better than non-Muslims, actually. But then not about behavior of Muslims in Europe. Don't you want to look at behavior patterns to supplement your research, not just on intentions from, from values? So that's my two questions. Yeah, yeah um, so you're asking about the country effects. Uh, and, and the income effects. Just say, yeah, keep out the Muslims yeah. with the wrong income in the, from the wrong countries. Does that, does that help a lot? 
Yeah, so um, again, I'm, not, I'm motivating the importance of this question by saying it's related to you know, ethnic profiling of migrants and that, that whole debate. Uh, I, I'm certainly not claiming this is gonna be the final thing that resolves that debate or even, um, you know, I don't even, can't even verify that it would have a, any sizable effect on that debate, but I still think it's very important to get it, get it right for its own sake. You know, we don't usually justify academic research, uh, the value of getting things right by n any need to uh, make an extraneous appeal to how it influenced policy. We just value getting things right for their own sake. Now on, um, on the country dummies, I think this is a very important question. So you could just say, oh, okay, but the, so it's the country dummies that matter. Let's just do ethnic profiling based on countries. And of course, the travel ban that was actually put into effect was kind of like some, most, many people think it really was intended to be a Muslim travel, a Muslim ban by selecting Muslim countries. But it sort of skirted that issue by trying to rely on picking out particular countries that, that were thought to be you know, dangerous sources of, of uh, migration. And of course, we could do the same analysis on the country dummies, which I have done uh, in, this, in this work. Uh, the first thing you would say about the country dummies is it turns out there's no country that across all 13 cultural dimensions that I showed you has, or even across the three different domains of trust, women's rights, and violence, there's no country that is consistently bad relative to the US in these results. If you look at all the country effects, and uh, I have a very unwieldy table that I decided not to show you of country effects in which there's a lot of mixed blue, blue and yellow of, uh, of you know, some countries have negative effects on some cultural values, and, and positive effects relative to the US on other cultural values, measuring country dummies relative to the US. And in particular, what's interesting is that uh, a lot of, uh, the great majority of countries in the sample uh, actually have better answers according to this scale on violence than the US. For example, saying war is never necessary to ach achieve justice is actually quite a, quite a large effect positive for almost all of the countries, including those that are on the travel ban list relative to the US. So, you know, if you're really worried about violent values, you should have excluded the Americans and let in all the migrants, everyone else. Uh, you know, you should have just stopped all the Americans at the border from coming back into the US and let in everyone else. That would have been the optimal policy based on the violence uh, values that were it seems that Americans actually are pretty violent on the cultural scale, that they're more likely to say war is necessary to achieve justice, more likely to be carrying guns, they're more likely to say war violence is sometimes justifiable against other people, uh, that stealing is sometimes justifiable. So it's kind of, it, I was kind of pretty surprised by that, but it's, uh, it's a pretty strong result in the data, and that's one of the main things that makes it kind of invalid, also it would not make the country dummies work well as a device for, for at, on the, as the basis of some kind of profiling of migrants. And of course, it would also be uh, true of the country dummies that, uh, and, and if you just measure each country effect as being the country effect of, of that, the, being from that country compared to everyone else in the World Values Survey, uh, most of those are very small magnitudes and, uh, and are also swamped by the individual heterogeneity within, within each country. So country dummies are not gonna do any better is the long answer to your question. What about looking at behavioral patterns? Behavioral patterns in Muslims. So these are, are, you know, these are the cultural measures that are most commonly used in, in, the, in the empirical literature. Uh, they're not the only ones. We could look for lots, of, lots more values and some of them could be based on behavior and not on culture. That would be sort of a different question if you think of behavior as being determined by culture, then hopefully it's kind of informative to get results on culture for, first from these. So, but I, I would agree that we could do you know, a lot more research on lots of other data sets uh, on culture and on behavior to try to get that, get those. Yes, please. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I was hoping, sorry. I was hoping you could talk a bit more about how you decided um, is considered like a cultural practice or a cultural belief versus a reaction to the context someone lives in. So I was, uh, in looking at, particularly with the country dummies um, analysis you had up there, 
uh, questions about trust and also about violence. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a bit more about how you establish whether that's an actual cultural belief or a reaction to the context that an individual is in and how that could change with migration. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you're asking how it would change with migration. So of course these are uh, one limitation of this, applying this to migration is these are not actually looking at the migrants themselves. These are looking at people in the source countries that you're talking about targeting for restrictions. So, um, so another, another thing that would be really worthwhile to do here would be actually use the U.S. data that we do have on you know, values of the U.S. population and, and again, try to tease out uh, you know, effects of migrant groups. And of course, that's the data set that uh, Raquel's great work on culture uses on, on migrants and, on and does include some behavioral uh, things like whether women actually work or not uh, you know, might also be another measure of, of attitudes towards women and that could differ among migrant groups that come from different countries, and that would be really interesting. Um, so that, that is all, like, again, invoking the solemn phrase, more research is needed, I agree with you. Uh, as far as how we're measuring culture, of course, it's always gonna be very imperfect. There's nothing, I'm not, I'm not doing anything of what you asked me to do. I'm just taking the, at face value the answer to the question. Do you agree that most people can be trusted Yes or no? Do you strongly agree? Do you strongly disagree? You know, that's a sort of uh, measure of your attitudes towards trust. And each question is, you know, not not a no no one question, and none of the questions, even all the questions together, are certainly not a perfect measure of of culture. That's that's very clear. But it's sort of the best we can do to address this question. And I think other measures of culture are likely to show the uh, should be explored more, but are likely to show similar similar results. Yes. Self-identification. In other words, a Christian Iberia, Jews until 1960 couldn't legally be there. Chinese right. exclusion, white Christian America, you can't come in. Perhaps Serbia and Israel in the future. Zanzibar killed all the Arabs when they got their independence. Right. I mean, uh, there are historical precedences that start from that basis. And then if you, you know. Yeah, so. Yeah, clearly you're right that uh, the demand for migration restriction is often driven by some sense of what is, you know, what is the right definition of an American, what is the right definition of a Zambian or a South African, and so and, and also your question is a reminder, the U.S. and Europe are not the only ones that are, are hostile, can be hostile towards migrants. You know, that's common across many, many countries. And it, like you say, it's often driven by a sense of, uh, of kind of, you know, eth ethnic nationalism that identifies the nation with a particular ethnic group and doesn't want uh, another ethnic group that is seen as non, non-national. So again, those are things that we cannot really address here. What we can address here, I mean, you mentioned the Chinese Exclusion Act of, uh, uh, which was first passed in 1882 and then reaffirmed uh, many times later, in 19, uh, most strikingly in 1924, which also excluded Japanese migrants and then there was, uh, you know, in 1924, there was also exclusion of, of uh, you know, targeted towards excluding Slavs and Jews and Italians. Uh, all, so, you know, to the extent it's based on some ethnic nationalism, that's, that's maybe harder to address. Mm -hmm. To the extent it's based on sort of a mistaken belief on how well ethnicity predicts the cultural values that you don't want to have, uh, you know, we can now look back on those historical debates on Slavs, Jews, and Italians and see that a lot of the alarmist talk about what bad culture they were bringing turned out, you know, not, it seems to make no sense today. It sounds ridiculous today. That's a more anecdotal piece of evidence that what, what you think is a really different, you know, permanent, inherent, huge difference in culture turns out not to be that. It turns out not to have ethnicity, turns out not to have great predictive power for excluding the cultures that, that, you, that you think you don't want. And so getting that question right may play some modest role in helping to clarify these, these debates, both historically and today. Yeah. Good afternoon, Professor. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, would it make the work of the, uh, the intellectuals, the, edu uh, the educators, would they make, and the researchers, would it make your work easier Less complicated and more honest. If they, if you would take the word culture out and replace it with race, 
Because uh, I find throughout the world, the African race is under siege. Most of the countries of Europe, uh, and including this country, there's a, a, a lot of uh, uh, pushback against the African race. And uh, most races, most groups, when they, when they uh, immigrate to a country, they take their culture with them. Africans have come to, was brought to this country, and they uh, gave tremendous uh, uh, of culture, work and, and, and culture to this country. And uh, now I find, as you mentioned, the, the president that we can refer to as S. Old president, who was referred to many of the, uh, the countries in Africa as S. Old countries, the same countries that the Europeans have been exploiting for centuries. You're allowed to say, and they, and they took to say their, sh shithole. And they took hear. their culture, they took yeah. their bad yeah. culture to the... Uh, to the African continent, destroyed it, still robbing and plundering the resources of the African continent. And now they have the nerve to talk about bad culture. I think it's about race. I think that word culture should be replaced with race. It would make it more honest. So yeah, I mean, I think the reaction against so-called bad, bad culture definitely had a racial, racial dimension when that quote about shithole countries lumped together Haiti and and African countries, and then compared them to Norway. I think it was pretty clear race was the was was the identifying variable there. And so that's a, again, it's something that uh, I did very similar tests that came out very similar on on race, on this question of white versus black internationally. And again, you find you know very small, not robust, not very robust effects of race on actual cultural outcomes. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. Don't worry, I'm getting no, through no, it. No, you can yeah, it from a yeah. Okay, so, um, and I, I actually agree with you that I think uh, academic economists in development, uh, maybe we're, we are not talking about race openly enough. You know, that there is, especially when race is playing a role in the debate, maybe we should be more honest talking about race more in development economics. I think we're all very afraid to talk about race because it's a you know radioactive third rail topic, and we avoid it whenever possible. But it obviously shows up a lot in lot, a lot of development discussions, and very much in this migration discussion. And also, why is it our researchers? We have great uh, African researchers that knows uh, our issues, knows the problems we have. But whenever it comes to is to 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 addressing our issues, it's always someone else telling our story and not us telling our story ourselves. The panels that I see from time to time does not reflect the, 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 the folks that you're talking about. Why is that so? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think that's all the more reason why you know, researchers should be really trying really hard to get it right, you know, should be before they're claiming that there is a, uh, if, if we're claiming there is an ethnic effect on culture, which I think there sometimes is, uh, I'm not disputing that. Uh, we should really clarify, we, we should really try very hard to get it right, what, what exactly we mean by that when we take into account all these other questions about robustness and individual heterogeneity across groups and not be in the position of telling you know, some other group what, uh, what we think their outcome should be and, you know, unless we're really just reporting a descriptive empirical finding that we think would be useful to having a debate that they and everyone else in the world should be having. Yes, please. Um, it was great to hear that question because it kind of provides context for what I'm about to ask. Um, we we to thank you very much for showing us that correlation between ethnicity and culture. And you know, it's good to have the data. However, policies are not being defined, as you rightly pointed out, on evidence. Um, however, my concern as a researcher is much more what is the public discourse and what are the labels and categories we use. And here we're talking about ethnicity and race, but really talking about Muslim or religion. Um, right. And when, when I heard that, you know, I'm doing research in Southeast Asia, which has two of the largest Muslim populations in the world, Malaysia and Indonesia. And I was like, but those countries are not on the list, so which Muslims are we talking about? And why is the press talking about it as Muslims? What specifically is going on? Is it a racial thing? And 
and you know, to your point, it's more complex than that. And when we repeat the, the shallow categories that are being used in policy, in academia, then we probably do everybody a disservice. So I wanna ask you, what do you think about so many Asian countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, all of which have huge Muslim populations, are they also thought of in this Muslim category or bad culture or ethnicity category? Or in what way can we make this deeper discussion? Yeah, well that's, I mean you're giving, first of all the Asian, some Asian Muslim countries are included in the sample and are, are part of the results. Uh, Malaysia specifically, I remember it's definitely included. And of course India with a large Muslim population is included in this sample. Um, so, I mean, you're giving some of the reasons why, uh, that are intuitively plausible why the Muslim effect fails to be, uh, to be robust is because it, it does vary enormously across countries. Uh, and there is enormous heterogeneity across countries and what may look like a Muslim effect to some, and it really turns out to be much more a country effect that again may be a totally non-ethnic thing altogether that may be based on histories of uh, authoritarianism, colonialism, civil wars, violent histories of violence. Um, so that's the, you're you're just affirming good intuition why why this sort of effect failed to be <laughs> failed to be robust. Yeah. Okay, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.